metric is knowing the right properties, the right methods, and the right type of speaking for the right circumstance. And I certainly don't see that as, as traits of above. That is very rare traits, very rare traits. And even within a court case, as I've said to a number of you, just preparing the knowledge that you get from these talk shoes and, and reading the canons and preparing into a monologue. I know that a number of you have tried the, the monologue. And it doesn't work. Well, the reason it doesn't work is that a court case doesn't simply rest on a monologue. Within a court case, there are periods of dialogue. In fact, at the beginning of a trial, there are prologues. There are opening speeches. And then there may be a catalogue, a catalogue of allegations, a catalogue of defences. Then there might be a discussion or there might be a forensic analysis, a forensic analysis of claims, an analogue. So within one example, there may be multiple types of rhetoric that are required to accomplish the entire process. So I want to help you with those things. And this is also going to be updated. I'll cover a couple of things on this, just knowing that you'll be able to read this by next week. Well, in, in rhetoric, we identify that there are five properties, there are six methods, and there are seven types. What I mean by properties. <coughs> properties are the common attributes of every circumstance of public speech. Now, if you go and look at public speaking, you can see checklists, they've got long lists. Yes, some of those things are important, what's the colour of the room and how much time you've got and, and uh, all those things, that's great. But let's get down to the, the nitty-gritty. We say there are five properties, and they are purpose, objectives, conditions, propositions, and constraints. Five properties of rhetoric. Purpose, objectives, conditions, propositions, and constraints. Purpose, well, why are you called to speak? Objectives, what do you need to achieve? Conditions, how and where are you going to speak and, and what are the, the, the issues in terms of conditions? Propositions, what do you need to say? What do you need to do to achieve your objectives? And constraints, is the room full of armed guards? Is, the, is, is there going to be the, the potential for interruption? All these things need to be factored in. They're the properties. The methods. Now, when you read rhetoric, Aristotle identified only three methods, ethos, pathos, and logos. Now, I'd suggest to you, based on the research and the, and the work, there are six, not three. And they begin with the first one, kudos. Kudos being praise, being fame, being name. Kudos is what we've been saying in terms of respecting the law, respecting the circumstance. Even if they don't respect the law themselves, that does not excuse you for not respecting the law. So kudos is important. And how you hold yourself, who you are. When you go to court, you are a tribunal of persons. You know this. We've spoken about this. You're a divine person. You're a true person. You're a superior person. Superior because you're a member of the Acadian society true person because uh, you were born and the flesh is the trustee of the true trust holding the res which is divine right of use and then you of course have a divine person you're a tribunal of persons the fact that you're there to clear up the matter of a straw man a Roman person doesn't reduce the fact that you're already there as a tribunal of persons so kudos who you are ethos character Honour. This is what we meant by honour and character. Ethics, from which ethos, the word ethics is derived from ethos. Pathos. Of course, pathos in Greek being the word for suffering, but we mean the emotional investment in being able to get the emotional empathy. Pathos is empathy. There's no point going to court and, and there being no empathy. That's part of the problem of going to court is there is no empathy. So looking and, and understanding wherever you are, not just the court, but wherever you are, empathy, logos, reason, logic, reason, tempos, the tempo, the, the pace, 
when one speaks, if one speaks even for 10 minutes at the same time, it can bore people to tears. It's the light and shade, tempos and dynamos, the energy levels. So there are six methods, kudos, ethos, pathos, logos, tempos, and dynamos. Then, of course, we have uh, seven types. I won't go through all of them quickly because I want to get through point three before we finish up. And I want to talk to you about the work on sacraments. But the types of, of rhetoric. Now, there's only three types under Aristotle, but we say there are seven in analysing, and that is the monologue. There is the dialogue, the discussion. There's the prologue, the beginning, the opening, the explanation, the first debater, the pretext, the epilogue, the summary, the eulogy, the end, the rounding, the conclusion, the catalogue, the forensic construction, the building of the case, the analogue, the questioning, the parrying, the debating, the adversarial contest in, in analysing and, and critiquing, and the ideologue, the expert. So within those seven types, I'm pretty confident we cover all the forms of rhetoric you'll ever cover. And the maxims will help you with that. So again, for the email that I was sent and for many of you that are saying, well, where is the tools? Help us. I hope that these new sections will, will find to be useful for you. Well, the third thing I said I wanted to talk about tonight is, is really a summary of the underlying concerns of this is all good, but where's this heading with Eucadia? And, and is this divinely inspired? And prove to me that it's not just Roman cult version 2.0 or New World Order 2.0. Which brings me to the work that has been conducted on the updates to ecclesiastical law. I was working on the canons of administrative law, which is the next batch of canons that were due to come out. And as we did that, we had in my mind and had in the discussions with a number of you the fact that we'd already proven all administrative acts, all public acts, are a mirror of a private ecclesiastical sacrament in the current system. All of them. And the proof of that is that every negotiable instrument, every public negotiable instrument, is an indulgence. So if you think in the way that they think, in the Venetians think, in the way that these people thought that set up this system, it's all about balance. So we're taught about the public, and you hear people go public, private, private, public, and I, I, I assure you when I, I would hear that, I'd nod and I'd say, well, what the hell are they talking about? Well, let's be clear. Public, civil, private, ecclesiastical. That's private, that's public. So there's a balance. So any instrument, negotiable instrument, is a balancing between the civil function, the public money, and the private function, the private money, the private temple money. And on the private side, when a, when a ritual is created, a sacrament, it's a balance between the spiritual and the temporal. And they're the two that balance out. Do you ever wonder what those windows, those fancy frilly windows are? Or now, in modern notes, the clear plastic? That's the representation of the spiritual the connection to the spiritual and temporal. And then, of course, you then have the private to the public. So realising that penance is the underlying sacrament of all court cases, that indulgences are the underlying function of all negotiable instruments, that baptism uh, sits there at the birth of uh, children, that marriage uh, is the underwriting of all contracts, when we, we discover that these are the, uh, the reflections of the private and public, it became clear that I couldn't complete administrative law until I went back and reviewed the sacraments that we were talking about and, and, and why. The question of why. What are, what's the purpose of the sacraments? Now, it's an easy question to ask. What is the purpose of the sacraments? And I'd say to you that in the first instance, when... I wrote these down. 
I was looking at the sacraments in, in a way as a mirror consumption of the existing system. But that's not good enough. That's not far, far from being good enough. If the divine plays a part in these laws, if these laws have any merit, then what do the sacraments need to reflect? Now, if you've read some of the different sections of Eucadia, you've probably seen that we list what we call the seven virtues of life. And they are respect, honesty, consistency or fortitude, enthusiasm, compassion, cheerfulness, and wisdom. I'll just repeat those. Respect, honesty, consistency or fortitude, enthusiasm, compassion, cheerfulness, and wisdom. Now, the naming of those are not by accident. And in fact, they are the naming of present moment virtues that match identically what's called the chakra points. You've probably heard the chakra points or the Kabbalah, which is another depiction of chakra. So these are the locks, if you like. And what's the relevance? Well, if one can live in the moment in respect, honesty, consistency, enthusiasm, compassion, cheerfulness and wisdom, I'd suggest to you one is living in the moment, aligning with their higher soul and aligning with the divine, aligning with the divine. So these life virtues, these virtues of living life, is about how to live life exactly like you're, you're supposed to live if we believe a single word of the New Testament or a single word of Hindu or a single word of Buddhism or a single word of the Quran because they all teach the golden rule and they all teach living in respect and honour, consistency. They may not say it as clearly or as forensically as that, but they all say the same thing. And that is the purpose of virtue. Well, if a sacrament, in every society, every religion is built up on rituals and customs. So if a ritual and a custom is to mean anything, would it not make sense that it exists to help us open ourselves up to living in the divine moment and to living our life better? And that, in fact, is the work that's gone into readdressing the sacraments as a gift, as something that helps us and proves to us that the divine wishes us to be more aligned, more balanced, more at peace, more in communion with one another. And that the corruptions of baptismo and Mariago and the Eucharist and all these rituals that have built in them curses and selling our soul to Moloch and all this horrible, horrible corruption of the Roman cult and the Khazar Venetians that have inflicted on this world can be cleaned up so that the key sacraments align, help align us to the life virtues. The life virtues help us to live life in a state of sacredness because this world is sacred life is sacred it doesn't mean that we become goody two-shoes it doesn't mean that we don't go out and enjoy ourselves it just means that life returns to where it should be life is special society is special life events are special we should take better care of, of ourselves we should take better care of our lives and that's what the sacraments are about. Now, we're running over time, but I just want to give a quick summary of what's happening with the sacraments. And again, these will be ready next week. We say there are three sets of sacraments. The first set are seven sacraments. They are the sacraments of recognition, which helps us with the virtue of respect. Then it builds on the second sacrament, the sacrament of trust, which helps us with honesty. The third is the sacrament of obligation, 
consists 